bit of background about myself. Um, I have worked in outpatient rehabilitation, and then I went to work um, for Autobach and travel around the world and the country um, for several years. So this is what my office looked like for about nine years. Um, I went on to work for um, Banced Arm Dynamics, now known as Arm Dynamics, um, for a couple of years. And then I had kids <laughs> and took some time off, um, but they've been around prosthetics um, since they were infants. Um, I've continued to stay involved. Um, and then in the recent past have started a nonprofit called Enhancing Skills for Life, which supports the Skills for Life bilateral upper limb loss workshops. Um, and other mechanisms and programs to get people that are missing both arms or all four limbs to get to face. And I also see patients um, and do some consulting work. So um, today we are going to cover how can you guys best partner with an OT and what should an OT be doing with my upper limb loss or limb absence client. Um, as you probably are pretty aware, the two most common upper limb amputation causes are trauma and surgery. That's quite different from lower limb, um, but approximately 75% of all upper limb amputations in adults are caused by trauma, um, so motor vehicle accident, machinery accidents, um, gunshot wounds, electrical burns. So why would this matter to occupational therapy? And how is this different from lower limb? Well, it can be kind of a psychosocial aspect that has to be taken into account because someone wakes up in a recovery room, doesn't, may not know what happened. So it's a traumatic, shocking, overnight change in uh, life situation. And so typically with lower limb, many times people are aware that they might be getting a limb removed and have planned for that surgery. So psychosocial aspects are quite different um, when it comes to trauma and upper limb loss rehabilitation. So we have to take that into account um, during our, our sessions. So um, when you utilize an occupational therapist in upper limb loss rehabilitation, what benefit is it to you guys? Why would you want to do it? Um, so I can answer the question um, for you, but ideally it's the best thing to do for your patient because they're going to have a better chance of improved outcomes. Um, I can just give you some of my observations over the past 20 years um, or so. I've traveled, you know, quite a bit around the U.S. and the world, and I've taught courses. I've done some problem solving. I've addressed technical assistance. I've treated multi-limb loss clients. And so what I've seen is that OTs are very underutilized or just not involved at all. And that's for various reasons that we'll get into a little bit more detail here shortly. But if the OTs are utilized, then what I've seen is they're typically only involved during and after once someone gets a prosthesis. And so, you know, why is that a problem? Um, if they're only involved during, you know, after once some, once someone has already received a prosthesis, you can run into a few problems. If range of motion is an issue, if swelling is an issue, if there's hypersensitivity, if there's scar adhesions. So a lot of those things, if we address them, that then ultimately could impact how a socket fits and how harnessing is um, in any kind of myoelectric programming or even the electrode placement. So we might, you know, the person might be really excited to start using their prosthesis on day one and we come to find out we've got to take several steps back before they can actually start wearing something um, and starting to incorporate it into their daily, daily life. So um, that's just a little background on um, why OT should be involved prior to even getting a prosthesis. Um, and so we'll get into pre-prosthetic therapy here in a little bit, but I do wanna cover um, billing when it comes to OT as opposed to prosthetists. So occupational therapists, you are all probably aware of this, bill for CPT codes and you guys bill for L codes, equipment. And so um, in a one hour outpatient where we might be doing some pre-prosthetic or prosthetic training, um, we're gonna bill for these CPT codes, current procedural terminology codes. And we usually do it you know, in an hour, that would be four units. And just to give you a frame of reference, four units, uh, each CPT code has a different reimbursement rate from private insurance, but Medicare kind of averages out for each of the codes. It's about $27, um, but some are higher, some are lower. 
anyway, so over an hour, that might be about $100. Hundred dollars, um, but we're going to spend a whole lot more time with the patient one on one and doing um, again that pre prosthetic, preparing the limb to wear a prosthesis, and then once they receive a prosthesis. So, here's a sample description of what OTs might use for pre prosthetic therapy: neuro education, uh, therapeutic exercise, community uh, work integration, self care management, wound care. So those are just some examples in case you kind of hear a therapist throwing those terms around. Okay, so now, old, old, old Autobach website, but just gives you a good reference of some different codes that might be used for an above elbow. I know this is probably old and outdated, but um, if you look at this and you take all these L codes into account and then kind of look at what the prices were or are associated with that, you could have a pretty expensive device that just sits in a closet. So I've kind of added up all these numbers for an above elbow, kind of basic, you know, standard tri uh, tripod grip, um, old timey hand, and that's about $75,000. I don't want to deliver a um, state of the art device or even you know, not state-of-the-art device and then have it just end up sitting in the closet. So real quick slide just to, again, show the costs of prosthetic devices. If you guys have, hey, um, yes. Oh, hold on for just one second because I just got a chat that somebody didn't, can't hear you. Um, okay. Rachel, can, are you able to hear Sean? Okay. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to. No problem. Hello. No problem. Okay, so this slide is just again going over generalized costs. Um, if there are updates, please message me and I will update my slide. But generally speaking, you know, your body powered are going to be way less expense, way less expensive than your myoelectric. Um, and then multi articulating hands that's going to go higher and any kind of um, cosmetic covering gloves are going to add to the cost as well. So um, again, just reiterating it's it's a expensive piece of equipment that just you know it's the more you can utilize an ot to help improve outcomes the better off you'll be um so it just doesn't get discarded so why are ot's not utilized by prosthetists some common answers i've heard and observations i've seen i can't find a therapist in my community that is skilled or experienced in this area I can't find a therapist in my community that's interested in learning. They're scared of the technology or they don't invest the time in something that they won't see very much. And I've trained several OTs how to work with my patients and then they leave. Contract work, change jobs, stay home after having a child. Um, so, and I, I can speak from my OT school. I had a chapter in a textbook and I had maybe one question on one test. So I did not get much in school in the way of occupational therapy and working with upper limb loss. Um, so most of it is on the job training. And so other reasons OTs are not utilized um, that I've come across is just knowing what the OT's role is and what they should be doing. So physicians, case managers, um, nurses, uh, prosthetists, may or may not know what an OT is, or if they do know what an OT is, they may not know what they should be doing. So that's kind of what this presentation, the rest of this presentation is about, is just to like, if you're not getting what you see in this presentation, you need to be asking for it. Um, so what's the process and how do you refer someone to OT? Um, we require a physician's script to see somebody. So all it needs to say is OT eval and treat simple as that and then we kind of make our recommendations and submit to insurance and go from there um, so you want to find a local facility in your area that has therapists skilled therapists preferably or even therapists that are just interested in learning because there are resources out there to help you um, you know to help that therapist that might not be so secure in their experience or knowledge um, there are therapists out there that are willing to um, assist in the process. Okay, so when it comes to insurance, private insurance and occupational therapy, I'm going to give you some scenarios. So they may be approved a set number of treatments. They might be approved for evaluation only. They might be approved for um, treatment visits only based on progress. And at the very least, the evaluation is usually approved. Um, so you might only get an hour or two hours with them. Um, so you have to know all of this stuff in advance. 
The OT um, will then recommend duration and frequency with the goals and submit the information information to insurance and then wait for approval. So a scenario that I ran into quite a bit was I'd, I'd look on their patient information chart or insurance chart. They were approved for 12 visits for the um, calendar year. So I needed to determine if they pre their pre-prosthetic issues or their prosthetic training issues were a higher priority and then distribute those visits accordingly. And I'll kind of go into this a little bit more when it, we talk about pre-prosthetic, but there's a lot of things you can do pre-prosthetically on a home program basis. Type up something and give that to them to, to work on home program, on a home program basis if it's a pretty pr straightforward case. So um, I also discovered through the course of working with patients, um, State Voc Rehab Commission is a, a huge help in the case of um, either no insurance or the insurance covers very little, um, that they can be a huge resource and help when it comes to return to work um, and any kind of um, home modifications. So if appropriate, research your State Voc Rehab Commissions. I've also talked to private insurance companies and been able to get a case manager assigned to the patient's case. I know there's a lot of turnover, but if you explain the specialty nature of this area, you can always request it. May not happen, but at least, you know, go ahead and request it. That way you're speaking to the same person every time instead of, you know, different customer service rep each time. So just something to think about. Okay, so we're going to talk about phases of upper limb loss rehabilitation. Um, and then once we get into the prosthetic training, there's going to be other phases. But so try to keep these a little bit straight um, or I'll try to keep them a little bit more clear. So ideally, the phases of upper limb loss rehabilitation include pre-prosthetic, preparing the limb to wear a prosthesis. I like another phase that doesn't happen very often, which is called interim or test socket and then prosthetic training once you have a finalized device. So those last two mirror image each other quite a bit, um, but just using a test socket versus a finalized device. So what typically I mentioned at the beginning, typically what happens is that prosthetic training is where OTs are utilized, but we're going to cover the pre-prosthetic piece of it right now. So like I said, we prepare the limb to tolerate prosthesis. We work on range of motion, strengthening, desensitization, scar tissue management, and swelling and shaping. So during this piece, and here's, you know, some interesting parts to it. I'll show some pictures in a second of the pre-prosthetic phase, but I first want to mention the golden period, which we've all heard of um, that study. And if you haven't, it's from 1984 and people are still referencing it these days, including myself. But the success rate for patients who are fit with a prosthesis within 30 days was 93%. Anyone fit after that 30-day window or golden period was it dropped to about 42%. So uh, what I want to show here is something that you could consider if you have a willing and able team approach is an immediate operative process idea. Um, but just avert your eyes if kind of gory stuff um, is not your thing. So this first picture is, is a little um, surgical in nature. So just wanting to show an example of someone you know, in the operating room, getting their hand removed, and then flaps, sutures, and then a um, uh, after everything's kind of uh, um, sutured up, then putting some sort of um, stockinette over it, and then a bivalve cast, hooking up um, a switch to a um, myoelectric hand, so that this person then wakes up in the recovery room with a prosthetic arm on. And um, then here, you know, a few days later in the prosthetist's office practicing with their prosthesis. It's not for everybody, just giving you an idea of something to consider if it's at all ever possible. So that person never really has the opportunity to kind of think of themselves as one handed. And even though it's a mechanical um, thing that might be attached to their arm, that it's something that, you know, day one they're they have on. So not for everybody, like I said, but if it's a team that you can work with in this scenario, you might want to consider it. So um, when it comes to pre-prosthetic intervention, for those that may not have had uh, an IPOP, um, you want to 
make sure that you're working with an occupational therapist, like I mentioned before. And so what does an OT evaluation entail and how does it help you? So it's probably very similar to your evaluation. Um, it's very comprehensive. It's looking at work history, living situation, any other injuries or issues, their past medical history, medications, um, side of limb loss, dominance, what, um, how are they able to complete certain activities of daily living? What assistance do they need? Um, and then what, um, what are their goals? So what I've done, or what I've been requested by, from CPs in the past is to submit my evaluation along with their prosthetic evaluation and recommendations to help um, insurance approve um, the prosthesis. So again, that's something that you could request and uh, compile into your arsenal uh, when you are trying to get insurance to approve um, a prosthesis. Um, okay, so what, what end result do occupational therapists want when it comes to pre-prosthetic rehabilitation? Well, we're going to work on our goals are going to include pre-prosthetically. Everything is focused around preparing the limb to wear a prosthesis. So we're going to look at controlling edema. We're going to try to help shape the residual limb if that's not already been addressed by the prosthetist. We're going to help desensitize the limb. Um, we're going to address phantom pain and phantom sensation. We're going to, uh, is there any kind of wound uh, care management that we need to do? Um, is there any contractures and scar management we need to address? Um, we're going to instruct them in residual limb hygiene. We're going to address uh, range of motion exercises and increase their muscle strength. And it, on the bottom of this slide, you'll see that this can, most of this, um, these bullet points can be sent home in a home program format. So you can preserve visits if you need to. Um, and so why, when you're preparing the limb to wear a prosthesis, why is that so important? If they can't tolerate it because their limb is too sensitive, then that's, it's you you have to address these things before you try to fit them with something so why do we need to work on these things it's again to prepare the limb so for edema control and re residual limb shaping we're going to use drainage techniques elevation wrapping comprehensive bandaging um, and then for desensitization techniques this thing over here is just a fluidotherapy machine which is like dried corn husks that fly around around someone's limb inside of a, a heated chamber. Um, we do weight bearing and we rub different textures around the residual limb. So the nerves in someone's limb, as you're aware, are used to traveling to the ends of their fingertips. When we're desensitizing, we're trying to train the nerves to the new set endpoint, wherever that may be. And so here's an example of something we might do with phantom sensation and pain is a mirror technique. Um, so the affected limb is behind the mirror and the intact remaining limb if they're a unilateral um, limb loss is in front of the limb and so they can trick their brain into um, sending signals and see and trick their brain into seeing two limbs and seeing signals um, sending signals to the affected limb behind the mirror and that has uh, there's so many different uh, ways to address phantom se sensation and pain and along with pharmacol pharmacological methods, but um, this is a very interesting one that I've had some good success with. Um, so wound care, um, prior to receiving a prosthesis, making sure the, there's not going to be any open um, areas, nothing that needs to be debrided. And then scar management, if they have adherent tissue and you put a prosthesis on it, it's just going to cause a free, uh, it's going to create a friction point and then probably cause um, skin breakdown. So we need to make sure that the skin moves with the socket. So we're well, going to use heat modalities, compression, soft tissue mobilization, and then range of motion. If someone cannot, you know, raise their arm above their head, they're not going to be an optimal and efficient user of a prosthetic device. So we need to work on that prior to them getting a prosthesis. We're also going to work on gradual strengthening, whether it's prone exercises, um, and lifting shoulders, or we're going to use TheraBands for um, scapular abduction or external rotation. And then for those, I won't get into bilateral because that's a whole other animal, but I'm just going to give you an example here. For bilaterals, we're going to work on um, core strength and lower limb strength um, for fall prevention and safety when for falls. 
All right, so continuing on with the pre-prosthetic rehabilitation piece of it, we're gonna explore psychosocial issues if needed, as needed. Um, looking at change in dominance activities, adaptive equipment assessment for if, if there's something that they wanna be independent with prior to getting a prosthesis, what type of equipment might be able to help them with that. And then, you know, if they're gonna be getting a myoelectric um, prosthesis, there are therapists out there that are um, trained and experienced in helping um, um, identify muscle sites and helping train those muscle sites. Um, and then if a patient has comes to an OT and hasn't seen a prosthetist yet, that's something that we can say, hey, you know what, let's let's find a three thera three prosthetists in your area your area and I'll help arrange those appointments if you need and, and I'll attend those with you um, if you'd like and so that we can um, again work as a team to improve outcomes. And so just kind of going over some examples of what we just talked about. So here's an example of a psychosocial. Um, we can make referrals if needed, make and do peer introductions if needed, in person, Skype, email, support groups, whether it's online or in person. Um, but so addressing the psychosocial aspect of things. And here's some examples of changing in hand dominance. So if someone was right-handed and they've lost their right hand, then we need to work on them being able to sign their name with their left hand or tie their shoelaces with their left hand or button their pants or feed themselves. And I mentioned the adaptive equipment. So I'll kind of go around the circle here, but this is a U cuff, a universal cuff and with a utensil in it so that someone could feed themselves if they didn't, you know, maybe in a, the example of someone that's with bilateral. Um, and then scoop dishes so that food doesn't slide off the plate um, they, since they don't have another hand to help keep it in place. This is a one-handed nail clipper, a suction cups on the bottom. Dice them to help hold things still, a plate, a cup, a phone, and then a rocker knife to help cut things, an adapted cutting board, jar opener, and a suction cup scrub brush that you can put in the sink to help clean your fingernails or put in the shower so you can scrub different parts of your back or your arm. Okay, so what can you do if you're unable to find an OT right away? Um, you can and should do your residual limb shaping. You can talk to them about desensitizing, de desensitization program and give them a home program. Um, at least have the conversation about phantom pain and phantom sensation. Um, and that phantom sensation is completely normal and it's just being able to feel that those that missing limb that's no longer there but phantom pain is something that needs to be addressed um, and then instruct them in residual limb hygiene but OT ideally should address range of motion and strength program exploring psychosocial issues wound care change in dominance and adaptive equipment so I do want to mention from the myoelectric evaluation, just the computer aided tools that are out there, whether it's, um, you know, co-op system or um, Autobox or B-Bionics. So the tools that are out there <clears throat> are if the therapist is skilled and knowledgeable with these devices, it's going to allow them the ability to determine how many muscles are available for control, the strength and separation of those muscle sites and the optimal muscle sites that will operate the, the prosthetic device. And so what I found when I saw that this device was at the prosthetist that I worked with, you know, 20 years ago, I was like, why don't we have that at our facility? Then we could tease out the problems, you know, prior to them even getting a prosthesis. We could train them how to use it prior to them even getting cast. They don't have to wait for a final prosthesis to learn how to use it. They virtually learn how to control the prosthetic device before they're casted. So I really feel like this put, this cuts down on patient frustration, training time, and time spent therapy. Ultimately, if, if you have a therapist in your area that's willing to do this prior to fit with the prosthesis for a myoelectric setup. Okay, so here's some videos. Please raise hands or wave or someone yell at me if they do not, um, uh, if you cannot see them for whatever reason. Let's see. Myo Boy, Myo Soft Old School showing his open signal and a closed signal.
so this is a first day scenario maybe later on during the session or the next day we can look at raise your arm above your head raise your arm out to you know move it out to the side move it down towards the socket so and helping maybe helping you guys find um, the appropriate sites so here's an example with a test socket on a couple sessions later and so if they're able to operate uh, some this virtual thing within a test socket great if there's a lot of effort and struggling and shaking going on, then maybe we need to find some more sites or turn up the intensity, um, the sensitivity of the electrodes um, or within the computer programming. So with the introduction of pattern recognition, a lot of this stuff is kind of no, you know, depends on which system you have. Pattern recognition is a fabulous option. So this is just the difference is you have a multiple electrodes on the forearm and it picks up a pattern instead of one electrode on the extensor side and one extensor on the one electrode on the flexor side um, causing it to open or close. So in this scenario they're picking up a pattern and then um, they can retrain that pattern every day if they need to. I feel like pattern recognition sometimes takes the OT out of the picture but in a good way. Um, so it just kind of speeds up the process. All right, so I've mentioned, you know, this interim phase and test socket. I feel it's helpful for everyone. I feel it's helpful to you guys. So you, if there's problems that you see once the process has been delivered, um, then you can address them in the test socket, which is a lot easier than to take apart a finalized prosthesis. It's helpful to the OT because they can take that test socket into therapy and try things out and see how it works in real life scenarios. And then it's helpful to the patient. Um, so it's different, you know, it's, it's the added weight and it's doing it in the different body positions. So they're not just staring at a screen sitting down. They're able to really test it out in real life situations. So here's just examples of what that may look like. Easier to correct issues in a test socket rather than a finalized device, like I mentioned. And test socket. Okay, more test socket pictures. So I'm going to get into what these videos or the, the images say at the top, controls, training, repetitive drills, um, ADLs. So um, I'm just talking about test socket for now. So they're going to cover these things. We're going to cover these things in a bit more depth in a second. Let's say test socket didn't happen and you've delivered this prosthesis and it's fabulous. It's amazing. And the patient demonstrates and they've demonstrated they can open and close the, the prosthesis and they can rotate the wrist and they can maybe bend and extend an elbow. Is that enough? In my opinion, no, um, because what if that's just inadvertent randomness? So they really need the prosthetic training. And so I'm giving you a generalized idea. Um, these are from some um, chapters in older uh, texts from Diane Atkins and Dr. Meyer on upper limb prosthetic training, just to give you an idea of maybe when someone um, has an amputation and when they go back to work and how long their rehabilitation training might take. Please don't, you know, use this screen in any kind of um, insurance denial appeals or anything. It's just an idea for you to know. We used to play a game at my old outpatient facility, kind of like um, I can name that tune TV show where it's I can treat that below elbow amputee in four hours. And um, I can treat that unilateral below knee amputee in three hours. So it totally depends on the person. And there's lots of things that go into it. Problem solving ability, cognition, age. But um, I would say that unilateral transradial, you're, you're going to see, you know, quite a bit uh, less time um, in prosthetic training. Okay, so with prosthetic training, it's a gradual progression of skills, and you're trying as best you can to have them incorporate that prosthesis into their daily life. So th some of the things we take into account, is it a new amputee or is it a new prosthesis? Is it body powered or is it electric? Are there any other injuries we need to take into consideration? Any other missing limbs? Um, the level of limb loss, their age, cognition, problem solving ability, activity level, and do they have any adaptive equipment needs prior or even after now that they've received their prosthesis? 
Um, so again, what are we trying to accomplish? What do we want to achieve during prosthetic training? So here's, I'm just bullet pointing the goals. Um, we have a quick reference to OT guide and these kind of bullet points come from those, um, from those uh, textbooks. But in general, um, this is not typical, but we do wanna make sure we're monitoring the residual limb. Are there any changes in volume? and shape. Is there any HO? Is there any bony overgrowth? Um, we want to orient them to their componentry if that has not been covered by the prosthetist. We want to instruct them in a wear schedule, how to take care of their prosthesis and do a skin check. Um, we want to practice and repeat putting their prosthesis on and taking it off. And then we're going to address control training, repetitive drills, and bimanual or two-handed functional skill training. That's just basically a fancy way of saying activities of daily living with two hands. So those three is what we're gonna talk about in a lot more depth here with the rest of the slides. But so continuation of goals is we're gonna continue with muscle training if it's appropriate. We're gonna discuss energy conservation education. We're going to address recreational and avocational skills. We are going to discuss got her into work and maybe even may uh, work state um, a set uh, evaluation, make those peer introductions if they haven't already been done and continue with psychosocial needs um, and referrals as needed. And then any other referrals, is it, do they need a work hardening um, evaluation done? Do they need a driver rehabilitation program? Any other kind of referrals that might need to be done will we'll hopefully help um, discuss that with the physician and make appropriate referrals if needed. But so we'll talk about the controls training, repetitive drills, and bimanual functional skills um, here in the upcoming slides. But that's kind of where I think the meat of the OT's skill sets and what they need to spend the most time doing falls. Um, okay, so an orienting people to componentry, just a review. If it's a shoulder dysartic, then how do they position it? So like that in this scenario, he's using a kitchen sink to hold on while he nudges a lot, an unlock switch. And then that then once he stands up, that arm is in a, a flexed position so that he can then reach into a cabinet, overhead cabinet in his house. Um, so then in, the, in an elbow situation, how does it lock? How do you internally and externally rotate it? How do you flex and extend it? Is there a lift assist? Um, Matic forearm balance. How does it? How does a wrist rotate? Does it flex and extend also? And how does it open and close? And how do you change out terminal devices for a terminal device? Um, so I'll make sure. Please yell at me if this video does not play. This is an example of a bilateral above elbow demonstrating how he rotates his wrist how he fixes and extends his elbow. Which if you realize what he's doing, it's showing that if he's got a fork or something, he's able to stab something on a plate and then bring it up to his mouth. And I'll try to fast forward here a second. So he's just locking and unlocking his elbow. Okay, but, and then opening his terminal device. So in the next um, request, it's having him flex his um, five function wrist from Texas assistive devices. This allows him again to eat um, or to wipe or do anything midline. So on a bilateral, a five function wrist is extremely important. Just my plug there. All right, next slide. Um, we discussed a wearing schedule a few slides back. One of the things I just want to um, let you know from my vantage point, many times, uh, you know, a patient says, yeah, I heard about a wearing schedule, but I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. So if you have the ability to type something out and just give it to everybody um, with something basic as this, please do it. it. Just don't assume that they're going to remember what they need to do. And it's important that they gradually increase their wear time and tolerance. It's like a new pair of shoes. And if they put it on and wear it for eight hours the first day, they're going to probably get a blister and then they won't be able to wear their arm for a day or so. 
So, um, and just teaching them that if there's a spot that's red and doesn't go away after 15 minutes, you know, get back in touch with you guys so you can make adjustments. Okay, so um, moving on to Dawn and Doff, uh, taking, putting a prosthesis on and taking it off. Can they do it independently? Do they have a locking pin liner or do they require pull sleeves to pull into their prosthesis? If they need help but want to do it independently, what equipment might help them? So here's some videos. Apologize, I could not embed videos to save my life. They worked two days ago, but I could not figure out how to get them to work yesterday. So I've had to improvise and add these buttons. So locking pin liner that he's able to put on independently, gives him some extra stability. <clears throat> and able to put on. All right, next video. I like this, it's an example of an above elbow um, using a pull sleeve to get into her prosthesis to use suction with no harness. And with a weighted end so it'll guide through the pull hole. And, you know, at home, she might do it completely differently. This was just a, a video we were trying to set up in a workspace and she was able to adjust by finding a, a little stool nearby that where she should, where she would be able to do this by herself. But harnesses, you know, ha she just hadn't worn a prosthesis in so long because they were always so heavy and she didn't like harnesses. So this was just an attempt to help her um, take some, uh, of the workforce off of her left arm since it was starting to become overused. All right, and then this, I love this video because it just is fabulous. Again, it shows you with um, motivation and a creative prosthetist um, what people can accomplish. So this is his setup um, of how he, it's kind of almost like a dressing tree where he's able to then put on the prosthetic arms independently by himself without requiring the use or the help from um, a caregiver or a spouse. So if I have someone coming to me saying they can't put a prosthesis on, this is one of the first videos I, I try to pull up saying, well, we'll figure something out. All right. Okay, so the three phases, the meaty part of OT. So we're going to talk about controls training, repetitive drills, and biomanual functional skill training. So once they have their prosthesis, these are the three main things we want to address. Um, and so when it comes to controls training, um, well, I'll, I'll go back here for a second. So we're making sure that they follow explicit commands and it's not random. For repetitive drills, we want to repeat, repeat, repeat muscle memory. Um, it's it's important piece of it and shouldn't be skipped um, and I'll explain why in a second and then two-handed activities um, for the bimanual functional skill training is what you should do the very last not the very first so for for OTs, there is a method to this particular sequence of madness. We do not want them to put the prosthesis on the first day and try to feed themselves. It will just frustrate them and get them not motivated to want to try and practice. I have found over the past, um, oh my gosh, 15, 15, 20 years that the best chance of success for incorporating a prosthesis into your daily life it is if it's done in this particular sequence. It gives the OT an opportunity or the prosthetist an opportunity to tease out any problem areas instead of guessing what could be the problem. I wanna make sure each phase controls training, I complete with 99 to 100% accuracy. Of repetitive drills, 99 to 100% accuracy and consistency. And then I can move on to the next phase. I wanna make I hit that milestone nine times out of 10, you know, or 9.9 um, .9 times out of 10 that they're doing it before we can move on to the next phase. If they can't, there's a problem somewhere. So controls training. Um, it's mirror motion of the therapist. It's saying, open your hand fast. 
close your hands slow, raise it over your head, um, pick up something or sorry, reach towards the floor and open your hand. So basically we'll ha watch that evolve and see, and that might take, you know, one minute, might take 10 minutes, but we'll watch that evolve and see how um, exact they're with, um, with the requests of the therapist, but start with the component that's used the most terminal device and then move to the other components and then work on how do they switch between a terminal device and a wrist. If it's a myoelectric or a body powered, um, how are they going to switch between their elbow and a terminal device if they're above elbow? So um, we will work on open and close of the terminal device, rotate the wrist, extend the elbow. We're working on direction. We're working on speed. We're working on stopping um, at a selected point. We're working on switching between components. During this process, we're looking for fatigue and frustration. We want to make sure that they're following the commands and that it's just not randomly opening or rotating when they didn't really want it to. If that's happening, we have to figure out why before we can move on. So we want them to have knowledge of all the components, become proficient, and combine the use of their components, and then make it so at some point it becomes spontaneous for them to use the components. So if they're in, you know, 90, 99%, 100% accurate, consistent, um, efficient, let's move on to repetitive drills. Okay, so here, um, just an example of a below elbow Greifer wrist rotation. So Again, I've already done the piece where I've made sure that they are mimicking the therapist, but now I want to put some objects inside their prosthesis and see how they can manipulate that. This is kind of like a higher level activity. I would just have them grab a cone and move it to the other stack first. And then the next step is when I would try to introduce the wrist rotation. This is just an example of something that you could do or the therapist would do. And again, if they do this over and over and over again, then you know you can move on to the next step without dropping or crushing anything. And so here's an example of some clothespins. I'm sure you've seen all of this stuff before. And one thing that I'll talk about in a second is that he's rotating his wrist to get it in the griper into the appropriate position to pinch the clothespin. Most people on their first day of therapy don't do that. They end up contorting their body instead. So we talk about pre-positioning here in a little bit. But I will say that this I hear the most complaints about because it's, um, it's pegs or cubes. They're like children games. And so many people say, oh, I, I don't understand what I'm doing. I'm just picking up blocks. Well, really, you know, if the therapist can explain it to you differently, to the patients differently, that it's there's there's a reason behind it um, we want to repeat and do these things because if you drop a cone on the floor it's less um, frustrating and threatening than a glass of um, water so um, if we feel confident in this then we can move on to actual tasks like holding a glass of water so here's just some more examples of pegs and a little ring stand when it, again, we just we don't want to make sure that they are random movements. We want to make sure they control their speed and we want to make sure that they're thinking about the pre-positioning of where their hand or their terminal device needs to be. So if think about if you go pick up a paper towel underneath a rack um, under a countertop, your hand needs to be supinated. If you pick up a Coke can from your desktop, your hand is in neutral. If you pick up a pen from a table, it's pronated. So in many situations, um, whether it's below elbow or above elbow, I will see people twist their um, midline, twist their, their waist um, to go do that activity rather than try to rotate the hand or the terminal device into the appropriate position. So it's something that needs to be taught to many people. So in summary for repetitive drills, we wanna make sure there's success with non-threatening or frustrating activities. Um, build comfort through this repetition motor planning and the knowledge that the prosthesis is going to do what they want to do when they want to do it if it doesn't there's a problem and we need to address it okay so once they've done those two steps now we can move on to the third step um, adls and two-handed skill training so i would start off with something that is more um you know one step two step and gross motor like folding a towel 
um, putting a pillow in a pillowcase. Later, you could move on, move into making a meal and wrapping a present. Um, so here's just some examples of individuals doing their two-handed tasks. So we've got self-care, we've got vocation, vocational things that we're going to um, address through these next couple slides. So this is just meal prep when it comes to self-care activities, brushing teeth, wrapping a present or sewing a button on, fixing a tie, using a button hook to fasten buttons on a sleeve, tying shoelaces, clipping nails. This is quite impressive but incorporating the prosthesis into basic activities of daily living, making it spontaneous. So um, we're, we're gonna go over a few more pictures and slides, but so just some more examples of things that we'd wanna address if needed. So childcare, and then um, in this scenario, practicing on a stuffed animal prior to, you know, practicing on a real child. Um, they, um, when it comes to on the job and vocational activities, making sure that we have a complete and thorough job description, making a work site visit with the person, with the patient, and then do, do they even wanna return back to the same job or are they going back to school? So what is it that we need to address in therapy and how can we simulate that so it's as close to what they're gonna be encountering um, as possible? And when we also wanna address a vocational activity. So is it fishing? Is it hunting? Um, we also want to address community reintegration. So being able to go place an order for food at a counter um, and grab a Coke from a dispense machine and sit down, go to the grocery store and maybe um, pump some gas. Um, okay, so in this, what I want to talk about now are just resources that are out there for you. So um, in general, you want to utilize your manufacturer representatives. Um, so it, they're the ones that are kind of the experts on the technology. So if there's anything you ever need from them, whether it's a loaner or um, technical assistance, those manufacturer representatives are going to be, you know, extremely helpful. Um, I think that YouTube and web search engines are another great resource. Um, social media is amazingly helpful um, in support group aspects, maybe not so much others. Um, conferences that are out there, whether they're annual or triennial, or if they're virtual. Um, you can also make sure you find the, the various consultants that are out there, um, the peer networks, support groups, amputee coalition. You want to make sure you find if they need anything with home modifications. Um, it, for those that you may may or may not be aware, there is an international group of OTs trying to help disseminate information about um, occupational therapy and upper limb loss. And it's just, it's a group called HandSmart and you can just Google that and find out a little bit more information on them. Um, and then I, let's see, what does this say? I can't see it because something is at the bottom of my screen. Um, okay, so resources that are specific to training and prosthetics. If you wanna take a screenshot of this, you can go Google these things later. But Michelangelo, um, Bee Bionic, I, uh, um, I cannot remember which other manufacturers, but they all have training brochures. Um, so you can go out and find um, information on and, and pass that on to the occupational therapists if they're not familiar with, with the technology or how to train. It's a, those are helpful resources. Um, from six years ago, there is a PM&R clinics on, um, various chapters when it comes to pre-prosthetic therapy and then prosthetic training. So you can go look up all those different chapters, but PM&R Clinics, North America um, from I think 2014. There's the Atkins Meyer, Comprehensive Management of the Upper Limb Amputee. There's the Atlas of Limb Prosthetics, may not be chapter 11 anymore, sorry about that. Um, there are old Autobach online courses from years ago that have some of this OT information that you, I'm sure they still have on a hidden website somewhere. Um, and then there is a Mayo training manual out of the Netherlands that you could probably Google or find. And then make sure to, to utilize your academy resources, the state of the science number nine on outcome measures in upper limb prosthetics, and then the state of the science number 12 on body powered versus Mayo. And so APT Coalition will have your support groups um, information that you could find for upper limb. Um, 
but I, what I the last part of the presentation here is 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 a little bit of information on bilateral upper limb loss and the and quad um, multi limb loss and what resources are out there because it's more rare and unique than just upper limb loss in general. Um, they're completely dependent for some period of time and there are entire conferences like I mentioned previously that are dedicated to this. So they're called skills for life. Um, we our next one is planned for 2021. It may be moving because of COVID, but we are we're still looking into it. So make sure you go and find the Enhancing Skills for Life uh, website. Oh, here's pictures from the different conferences over the years. Uh, but make sure you go find the Enhancing Skills for Life website if you are interested in learning more about the Skills for Life conference um, organization. And then also um, within Facebook. Oh. Uh, Skills for Life has a closed group for people that are missing both arms or all four limbs where people can go ask questions and get answers and then similar for um, quads, they have a closed group on Facebook to so make sure your pa patients know about it if they are not already aware. Okay, I think that wraps it up. So Elizabeth, um, is I don't know how much time I spent, but is there time for questions or there, yes, there's, do you need to move on? Nope, you're good. If people have questions, they can go ahead and chat them to you. I'm going to send everybody the serve, Sean survey right now. You know the drill. Getting good at it. <laughs> There's the survey. If you don't get it, let me know. I'll email it to you. Okay, so if I just go to chat, that's where I'll find questions. Chat. Okay. Yep. And then, and I'm just going to turn off my video while I Well, I'll turn it back on while you're waiting for your questions to come in. Uh, we will start, John, at 2.30, and then um, Niles, we were going to give a little bit of a break in between because you probably needed to stretch your legs. You just sat through, through um, a, a long segment. So after... <laughs> <laughs> no, Sorry. We the, not, no, 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 that we had, we had it merged. So uh, have a little bit of walk around. Niles will be done before five o'clock. So if we, we start him at 345, he'll, he'll be done by 415 at the latest. So don't, don't, we'll take that little break in between John and Niles will get Niles set up and then um, we can get out of there early since it is Friday. Uh, but Okay, Jim Rogers, I saw your question and I will email you, but um, you also see my email down at the bottom. So if I write your email down incorrectly somehow, JPRCPO871, I will get back to you um, soon. Thank you. Great question. Okay, let's see. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions. I will say that I had a couple people ask about the presentation and it will be going up on the portal on Tuesday. So you'll be able to watch it there if you missed any of it or if you just want to watch it again from the beginning. You can also contact Sean or any of the other speakers by going to the speaker page on that tsop.attendees.com. Go to the speaker page and there all of their contact info should be should be in there or um, they, you should be able to click and contact them via email or go to their websites if they have websites that are attached also. So you can do it that way just in case, but you will be able to go back and watch all of the presentations on demand. Whether, whether you just want to, you don't need to do it again for credit or you just want to go back and use them as a resource, they'll all be up there through the middle of December. Someone says, Regina says there's no survey. Oh, Regina, Regina. I'm sending it again. If you don't have, if you can't see that link, like John said, your pop-up blocker might be on um, because it does go to an outside page. It goes to the SurveyMonkey link. I will send that to you in your regular email and I just send them as links. You could just click on them in there. If anybody hasn't received any of the ones that they've seen so far, you can just email me. And thank you, Sean. That was awesome. Yeah. So did I stop sharing it? <laughs> you, you have stopped sharing your screen. And I'm going to, everybody's going to head over. I'm going to go get John ready. And I have to kick everybody out of here because I can't do two Zooms at the same time. That's for tomorrow. That's for tomorrow's Zoom. So thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. And All everybody's right. got Sean's contact information if they have more questions. So. 
All right, thanks everyone. Thank you.